Hey, TJF, everybody. Happy Friday. We've made it. Not only is it Friday, the end of the work week or school week for some, it is episode 10. Finally made it to the end of the HCG Show and Tell Social Mixer Summer Series. So just wanted to give a special shout out to everyone who has tuned in, whether it's live on Instagram Live or later on Instagram TV when these air. Just want to say how much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for making this such a wonderful summer experience and giving me a chance to have this experiential experience and experimental experience (laughs) and also just um, get to highlight some anime, comic, and gaming creatives, artists, merchants, those who are fans of the genre and taking it from what is known as a local networking space to build community and build your brand and to be theme-based events is also something that could happen online virtually as well, especially during this time. And I want to take a moment and say I hope all of you and your loved ones are well and staying safe and that, you know, we just live each moment supporting and caring for each other during these times. Um, So, yes, so thank you to the viewers. Thank you to Sponsor. Thank you to all the virtual guests who have been on. Thank you to those who have been sharing when the Instagram TV over the Instagram lives do go on every week. So I appreciate that very much. This and all the summer ACG show and tell social mixers were sponsored by nerd like underscore geek like Instagram page. So please go to them, like them, follow them for all things related to conventions, anime, comic, nerdum, geekdom, whatever you fancy. Please check them out. And I want to say thank you so much. Much love to them for sponsoring me for this summer series. I couldn't have done it without their help and support. So those of you who are joining as audience members, thank you so much for tuning in now or if you tune in later on Instagram TV. Um, feel free throughout the session to just leave a comment below or a question you have for our virtual guests that will be on in a few seconds and also throughout the session as well. So I'm going to be bringing in my guests shortly. So let me do that. Oh, I was going to fix my camera. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, great. I just got to fix up my camera. <laughs> How are you? All right, hopefully it doesn't fall over. I'm good. How are you? Great, great. Thank you for tuning in with me. I really appreciate it so much. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy, you know, to always be in your presence because, you know, what you do for the culture Everything you do, you know, connecting people, and uh, I truly appreciate it. Thank you for, you know, reaching out and we know each other from before. So uh, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. Yes. So I want to formally introduce you to everybody. So it's the Bronx toy designer, Rios Balante. We'll be talking about a little bit about his background as a toy designer and other things as well. Born and raised in the Bronx, Bronx bred. Um, We'll be also showcasing later some of his comics, his toys, and his clothing line as well, which are all up for purchase. So check out his Instagram and website, which we'll give out later on in the show. So we did meet last year because I had my second in-person ACG social mixer and I invited you because I saw you on Instagram. I think I saw you on New York one with the Bodega Blade model, the toy. And I was like this, I need to get to know this person, who this guy is and know about the character as well. I just thought it was very unique and culture, you know, just for the culture and very innovative and something that we all can relate to. So definitely wanted to have you on in that themed event that we did last year at the Boogie Down Grind Cafe. So shout out to them and appreciate them for the space. And, you know, we were able to hear your story and your inspiration of, you know, going from a toy designer and your upbringing as well. So, you know, that's how we met. So I just want to know a little bit more about who you are and who you could share, you know, besides myself, who you could share with the audience of who you are as well. Sure. Uh, My name is Rios Palante. You know, not everyone else, but I'm from uh, I'm from the South Bronx, born and raised. Uh, I've been drawing all my life. Uh, everyone heard the coat, uh, the coat story where you know I was, I was a little kid and I used to draw in the back of my mother's coat closet. And she, you know, she found out one day and she, instead of whooping me, she encouraged me. So um, I've done artwork throughout my whole life. My father was an artist. 
for many years. Um, well, he was to his, you know, his death, uh, unfortunately. But he um, he handed down this gift to me, and it was the gift of being able to paint a picture with, you know, pencil, pen, marker, spray can. And uh, I've always felt like this feeling of uh, don't let that uh, talent go, you know, don't let it go to waste. I grew up in the South Bronx during the 80s and 90s. Even now, some spots are still kind of tough. And, and mm -hmm. I did I did grow up in, a, in an area where I had to kind of choose my spots and really be careful with the pitfalls. And somehow I'm still here. Uh, I went to college. I studied um, illustration and also toy design. Uh, when I when I finished from toy design, I went to uh, Fisher Price, Mattel, uh, Toys R Us. Then I got some uh, some freelance gigs with uh, Hasbro and some other toy companies. Um, so as you know, Toys R Us went under, mm -hmm. and uh, I was uh, I was left to be like, you know, what am I going to do now? And uh, while I kept my connections, I kept the, you know, the things that I learned, which I learned a lot of administrative stuff, which was, which is always kind of like a bad thing for artists. You know, we don't want to hear the numbers and we don't want to <laughs> organize. We just want to be messy and sloppy and, and do our art <laughs> thing. Uh, but not me. You know, I wanted to know the wizard behind the drape. And I was like, what, what's happening there? And, and so anyway, eventually I did move up. But as we know, Toys R Us went under, and I left. Um, I left a few years ago, and I started this Food Stamps um, comic book, which I had in the works for many years. I at first it was actually like literally food stamps, and it was about kids from the hood that just like the really funny stories about getting hit with chancletas and <laughs> you know very, very cultural central stories right. that can you know Latinos and blacks and uh, other minorities can relate to and uh, but I thought that was a little too literal you know I, I, I wanted to break into the scene into the uh, designer toy scene in particular because uh, there you can kind of express yourself more create these characters that are limitless you're not tied down mm -hmm. to a to a license like a superman mm -hmm. you can create your own and what I did is I said you know what I'm just going to go all in and I'm going to invest in myself and put my money where my mind is. And I created Bodega Blade. Uh, Bo Bodega Blade at first was this like, so I got the name Bodega Blade from uh, from this headline in the New York Times where, where, where someone tried to rob a store owner and the store owner had a machete on him and cut the guy's hand off that was trying to rob the place. And oh wow! The headline. Yeah. Um, we left off when you, you were talking about the origins of Bodega Blade, like how you came up with that name. Yeah, so I, I right, I came up with the name from the New York Times story of this guy protecting his um, bodega. Uh, but I, I, I felt like the guy needed a group. You know, I wanted to start make, to make a little world. You know, like uh, start to imagine uh, the environment, the neighborhood he comes in. He comes in the characters around him, the different personalities. And I created the Food Stamps comic. Um, and the Food Stamps comics, comic, in a nutshell, is a story about these kids from the hood who protect their neighborhood bodega against gangs that are trying to come and uh, take the bodega away because it's a piece of, like, uh, territory that will mm. help the gang dominate, you know, around the neighborhood. So uh, something that I know a little bit about. <laughs> and it's also... Uh, it's also uh, you know, it, it reminds you of like the Warriors story, which I'm a big fan right. of Warriors, and and I'm I'm a huge fan of uh, ninja and samurai movies, old kung fu movies, you know, Shokazugi ninjas, and uh, just everything. And um, so I wanted to incorporate everything into my childhood, my lifestyle, my background into these characters, into this world. Yeah, and I'm here talking to you. I made it. Yes, you did. So I'm really curious about um, because I grew up, you know, watching some old school kung fu movies with, of course, um, Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee, and you know, what were some was what were some movies or others besides Bruce? I don't know Bruce Lee is a big influence, but yeah, Bruce Lee is the number one, of course. Uh, 
But also uh, Jet Li, when he first came up with, I think it was Fist of Legend, the mm-hmm. game. It was all that, that the, the wire works where you hit them and they fly two feet away. Right. Uh, that, uh, of course, the 36 Chambers, you know, which is like a, a lot of people's favorites, but anime too. Like uh, uh, Ninja Scroll is one of the best. Right. Best. I was just watching that the other day. Oh, yeah. I was like, it still holds true. Yeah, so it's still it's good. Still, that and Akira is like Akira's mm-hmm. most apocalyptic feel. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, with ninjas, it was, uh, it was Shokazugi was a man during the eighties. And, and then I even like the corny stuff like blood sport with John, John Claude. Right. <laughs> and American Ninja. It was like the whitewashing of, of martial arts movies, but I like that era too. It was real cheesy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I grew up watching those movies. I guess my brother was such a huge fan of like, those, you know, John claude Van Damme movies, and then he moved on to watch, like, the Bruce Lee movies, and, you know, we even used to watch the behind the scenes and, like, how they even do these things, you know, and even the ones, like, before Crouchy Tiger came across the seas, you know, Crouchy Tiger hit a dragon, you know, how they came up with those theatrics, and to know that something that, you know, it could reach other cultures, you know, it could even surpass it. Absolutely, and there's a group, you know, it's a very hood thing, you know, it's a very, there's a different, it's a subculture, it's like this, uh, this takeout Chinese, greasy, <laughs> movie theater, rundown experience that I had, you know, growing up, it was, it was, yeah. it was beautiful, you know, it was beautiful. Uh, we used to go down to the Puerto Rican Theater, which was in 138th Street. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> Hands or Brook Avenue. And we used to go there. You, you jump in there and you can watch like four, six hours of Kung Fu movies. Mm-hmm. And then Saturday, uh, um, Channel 5, you know, for, for those that live in New York, was uh, uh, it was nice. It was like four hours again of like just Kung Fu. With this, you know, you know all that stuff. <laughs> and it was awesome. I wanted to bring that, you know, the, the stuff that I love, kaiju movies like Godzilla. Right. Mm-hmm. Ultra Man and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that stuff. And I wanted to bring that feel to it. I, I wanted things to not be politically correct, really. That's why the title is Food Stamps. You know, it's a, it's a clash between Kung Fu and Food Stamps. Mm-hmm. I wanted it to be provocative. I wanted people to go, damn, how dare you? And I was like, what? <laughs> That's what I live, so. Uh, right, yeah, definitely see, you know, bringing in some of that, you know, stuff that we grew up in our society and our culture that we had to deal with and, like, you know, bringing in some of those things, like, you know, we I grew up also in the 80s and 90s and, you know, just seeing a lot of the abandoned, you know, streets and the abandoned um, backyards and now, like, they built on top of those and growing up tough in a way, you know, and our parents had to, like, make sure we were, you know, good, but also teach us the street smarts. It's like kind of because, you know, you go to school, you go to work, and that's just a different mindset. And then sometimes when you have to come back home, it's like I have to switch, you know, yeah. I have to turn on that switch and be like, okay, now I have to be be extra strong, be extra tough, you know, and like change it. Yeah, I was, mm-hmm. never, I, was um, I was telling, I, I went to, to my old neighborhood last week and uh, we had a nice little like, uh, like this little block party baseball game thing and uh, socially distant, of course. But it was really, it was really cool because uh, we, we had so many stories. It's like, the South Bronx is different from what it was. And I told mm. people, hey, listen, when I used to run the base and go to second base and slide, you got to be careful. You might catch a syringe in your leg, you know, and that was, before. Yep. We, we had the AIDS epidemic, which was like scary. No one really understood that. And similar to what's happening now to where you, you know, okay, that uh, you can transmit the COVID with this coughing thing, but we, you don't really know the surfaces. There's a lot of, it's so new. It was like mm-hmm. the 80s or, and 90s with the well, 80s with the uh, AIDS stuff. And, uh, yeah, you'd see crack vials on the floor, and it was just, uh, it was it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. So it makes me wonder now, like, with 2020 and, you know, what kind of stuff they will create 20 years from now, like, what kind of influences they would take from what they're seeing around them. And I wanted to go into um, your other influences. So, you know, I 
a part of a brand called Tokyo Bronx, which is newly formed and will be bringing out stuff soon because we talk about the idea of bringing cross-cultural influences and mashups, you know? So you already have some of that in your Food Stamps brand as well. Yeah, uh, that that's a badass name, first of all. Like, I, <laughs> I love Tokyo Bronx. I, I wish I would have thought of that. Um, <laughs> Big ups to see the Gary and Ed, they, they came up with that, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it because when I, you were talking about the abandoned building stuff in the 80s and the ban during the abandoned buildings, those were my, that was my playground. It was, the playgrounds were more dangerous than the actual streets, you know. Yeah. Because all the drug addicts hung out in the uh, playgrounds and they did their thing, but you didn't want to be near, right? But I used to hang out in the burnt down, in the burnt cars and I used to, jump off the abandoned building windows and land in the uh, mattresses and do backflips. And I would cut my, my uh, the wooden pieces to the shades. I would mm -hmm. a point and we'd play ninja and actually <laughs> jab each other. And, you know, I was, and we'd throw rocks for ninja stars. Mm -hmm. And that did build an, a tough exterior, you know, and it did help me uh, understand like, you know, stranger danger before there was even stranger danger. You know, and it made me more street smart. But I also knew that, like, all right, it's really rough, but this isn't it. You know, that, like, it's really bad. I, I always knew that that was just my parameter. You know, I always knew. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it could have been my mom. You know, my mom went to school and she finished and she was kind of a, a she didn't tell me what to do. She kind of showed me, you know, what to do. So big ups to, to Mama Dukes. And she mm -hmm. really, she really, yeah, she really taught me and she struggled a lot. And I was just like, I always felt like paying back, you know, get, like this feeling of, oh, I got this talent and I'm just, without it, I'm a nobody. That's how I felt. And I was like, I gotta stay alive, do my thing, give back to my mom, my community. If I do something, I got to keep it real. So food stamps is like my way of keeping it real, where... We have Latino black characters that have stories that resemble ours and also, uh, uh, but also have fun with it where it's like has the Kung Fu stuff, the karate stuff, the eighties things with the gangs and just, uh, uh, I wanted to play with that. That's my world, you know? No, yeah, so it's so true. And it's like, I talked about this with previous guests and we talked about um, cultural representation and, you know, how it's, happening now in pop culture and in comics so i want to know your take you know because you've been working on these characters for a long time before this whole shift happened in modern society <laughs> it's crazy as it sounds and you know i just want to know like um what's your take when it comes to cultural representation now you know is are we headed in the right direction what do you feel um, cosmetically yes like it, um it's it's almost become fashionable and that's okay as long as there's meat on the bones. I know I'm using a lot of analogies, but it. it no, I hear so you. I feel you. Mm -hmm. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an artist, not, you know, a pop. <laughs> so good. So, yeah. We all know what you mean. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of like cosmetic stuff, like, hey, love black people, love Latino, represent re representation matters. And I, we've always fought for representation, we've always complained about there's not enough Latinos, especially like leading roles for men. It's always the women who are portrayed as like this hot, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, all, it's back to the Carmen days. Mm -hmm. It's always been that way. It's this hot tempered, fiery, sexy woman with her boobs out. And that bothers me, you know, cause I have children of course. And because it's like, it's, it's, it's my, my, uh, my culture that they're taking. And, and by day, I mean the man, right? are taking and, and kind of positioning it and twisting it up and then serving it back to us. And all we're doing is seeing these images. So we begin to live these, um, you, you know, these uh, stereotypes. We start to, same thing is happening in the hip hop rap community where, you know, you see things coming back at you. It's like a mirror. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, that's what I see in myself, but it's really not, you know? Um, Representation matters. I, like I said, we've always been an advocate of that. But I do feel that some people are kind of, um, which by the way, I got my black, as we talk, Black Lives Matter uh, t-shirt. But I do feel a lot of, uh, uh, it's a lot of it is bullshit. 
you know, because a lot of these people that are out there marching and it's great, but they're not friends with anybody that anybody that's of color. You know, they, you know, they got to have a friend, sit down and talk to them. You know, that's when you really can get to understand cultures and the pain that we, but more, you know, the black community, let's face it. I mean, it's been effed over for many, many years. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough reality, but Right. And it's like you said, you know, we've had for a long time people that are not from our culture or grew up in our type of society or socioeconomic status kind of tell us this is how it is and how it was, you know, rather than like they've experienced it and know, you know, how to portray that story. We need to have those that understand, you know, the idea of cultural representation, but on not a surface level, you know, working together in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, it is getting that getting what's cool about the culture, spitting it out. And just think of it like, okay, we don't see each other. We don't see ourselves in movies. You know, we don't see ourselves in high positions. We don't see ourselves. And what does that do to our, uh, to our security? You know, we become insecure. We see all these things. I mean, the way they portray Latinos jumping the border, running and criminals. And you see yourselves as rats and trying to run through this, like, big cheese that's America. And then, you know, it's ain't the USA, I remember, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it's tough. It's tough. But uh, we, Ray. But, so that's my job. My job is to keep it real. And to no, oh, definitely. Yeah. And I think you show that in your creativity and your art. And there's no denying about it anyway. But I wanted to go also into like you as a toy designer, because that's an industry also like the comic industry that, you know, we have people of color and our representation who have for years, decades have created, just didn't get the credit that they deserve when creating these characters or any kind of longevity. So I want to know how is that? Cause I, I've heard it from other comics when it comes to the comic book industry. So I want to know how is it when it comes to toy design industry? Cause you have mentioned like they have this one stereotypical type of what a superhero looks yeah. like, you know? Yeah. I, I, I've experienced that too. Um, I used to work on a line called True Heroes. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a, a, a more, let's say, fiscally appropriate type of um, uh, uh, action figure line that I designed the characters a lot. And when I would add something, because you know, when you go to the military, you see, you know, there's brothers, Latinos, Has Hispanics, uh, Asians, everything fighting for this country, right? So I would, and also video games, I've become a little more, video games are a little more uh, edgy, you know, edgy for lack of a better word. But <laughs> what, I, what I would try to design is things that I see, you know, contemporary stuff, you know, uh, add a little ethnicity to it. And I've always had a pushback. Um, mm. I've always had pushback on putting uh, ethnic people of uh, uh, other ethnicities in the packaging, you know, on the box. So that was a lot. That's a big. That's a big thing. And I think they're working on it now. But again, it it's almost like uh, are they doing it just for cosmetics, just for the marketing, right? To be like right. exclusive now. It's very cool. Is it the flavor of the month, right? Yeah. You know, so many times I sat there and I said, "All right, I have this design. This is great." Then somebody comes out with the packaging. It's like, no, they're too dark. No, they mm. don't. Uh, black people don't buy dolls, and it's just mm. stupid. These, these stupid statistics that really don't matter. Right. But yeah, I would design an action figure one time and I heard they named it uh, Thug Soldier. And it was <laughs> just, just because the guy had a goatee and a slick back. You know, mm -hmm. it was, uh, I was like, damn. And I, I've dealt with a lot of the, in corporate America, I dealt with a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like, you're, uh, uh, Rick, your name is not supposed to be Rick, but that's my real name, now you guys know. But uh, Rick Rios, Palante. So it was like, um, it, it was, it, it, you're definitely pushing upward, you know, and you, you got to kind of be strong and kind of like teach people rather than like be upset and, and uh, have this chip on your shoulder. You'd rather just mm. teach them. It's only ignorance. It's only because, you know, it, it's the same way of how you deal with a child. That's how I would always saw it. Right, definitely. Ignorance is a blessed day world. And so true, you know, like when you move up the ladder and then you got these, I don't know where they get these marketing teams from, where they're getting their statistics, statistics from, you know, so 
it's sort of one of it's one of those universal things that hopefully are changing for the better. And now, as we said, like it's just a front kind of thing, and what will bring in the money now. So, you know, and but people like you and other creatives that have been on this show and others that I've seen do podcasts as well that represent those of um, color and part of the culture. You know that you know is really shine a light to them, shine a light that they are bringing what they grew up in, their background, their upbringing, their stories, which is so important to tell as well, which is what you've been doing with yours as well. But um, we're at the halfway point. Okay. So what I wanted to do is, this is the showcase part. So I know you mentioned your shirt. So those who are joining in the audience, this is where Rios, as a virtual guest, will showcase some of his comics, toys, um, merchandise, anything as that's going on for sale, anything that he wants to share with us that he has created. And if you have any questions or comments, please put them below here on Instagram TV. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll start with the comic book. That's where it started from. Um, I started the comic book with issue zero in New York Comic Con, uh, but I just launched a few weeks ago uh, issue one which I uh, saw so you had Apple Nunez on, which she's the, she's the cover artist, the alternate. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to her. Great. Uh, so this is, um, this is the comic book here. This is, uh, this has Screwface on the front. Uh, F you, hey, man. Yeah, so. <laughs> and then this is Apple's uh, alternate cover, which came out great, you know. Nice. And when I seen her style, I said, yo, you got, you got to get down, and, and she did. Um, mm -hmm. That issue, that uh, first issue can be found on foodstamps.com. That's F U S T A M P S.com. I also have, uh, I'll show you the, the, the thing that started it all really was the Bodega Blade figure. And this figure was a little, a little controversial. That's what got me hooked, yeah, when I saw that. <laughs> it, was, it was also a little controversial. People felt it was like a uh, stereotype, but I said, F U, it's empowering, you know. and, and Whatever, man. You're always going to have to. This is a yep. thing here. So you can see. I'm really proud of this guy. He started it all. The sword is removable. I would show you, but I'm holding the tablet with one hand. No, no, I got it. Um, so what made you come up with the this character and also his design as well? It's not the typical, like you said, so, you know, those heroes they want you to create sometimes. <laughs> Right, so I want kids to see themselves in this, rejecting what we want people to see. And um, this hero has beef and broccolis on. Yeah, remember those? Yeah, oh, man. He's there, and you've got the parka, of course. So it, it, you can tell he comes from, like, a, a place that is pretty cold, which would be the East Coast. And uh, he has his scully there and his baggy pants. So this guy looks kind of like us and in a cartoony, exaggerated way, right? Mm -hmm. And then my second release uh, was Demonio. Again, Demonio, Spanish for demon. I'm sure that's pretty obvious to a lot of people. But this is um, this is the New York Comic Con exclusive. It's the Exorcist colorway. He has the right. colors. Uh, he has a removable head. I can uh, if I got the head here. Let me show you. Anyway, take my word for it. He has a removable head. He can add a mask to his head. Uh, right. Yeah. So this guy, um, he 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 was raised in abandoned buildings. He's kind of like the back in the '80s. They would there would be sometimes just one or two buildings up in a block, right? Because everything was burnt down. And we created these kind of ghost stories on people that we didn't really know. You know, like mm. really old woman down the neighborhood, and and we called her Bruja a witch, and yeah. created all these stories because <laughs> she was so serious. So he yeah, <laughs> every neighborhood had one in the Bronx, yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> or at least. It. Yeah, so everybody thinks it's like this, like this really evil, creepy uh, ghost, but he's just a kid that that was uh, he was actually um, killed in in one of those buildings. So mm -hmm. these are this these characters look all poppy and cute sometimes, but the stories are pretty. Uh, they get pretty pretty tough, you know. Um, just like my neighborhood. Right. This, this mm -hmm. is the third one. This is Screwface. This is the, uh, he turns on the team and on the food crew, which they are, and turns into a bloodsucker, which he creates his own gang, and his gang consists of little monsters called the Kai. I'm loving he got the sandals with the socks on. That's official <laughs> city, city yeah. 
That's all right, right there. <laughs> I felt that uh, I felt it looked like a samurai to me. I was like, oh, the chocolate does. If I add, because the chocolate does really don't come with the toe separation, not these Nike ones anyway. Right. I see that. Yeah. But I was like, oh, I gotta add that. So he looks like a samurai. And even his um, do rag looks like almost like an Under Armour kind of like a yeah thing, you know. So I just thought that was uh, I, I, he's probably one of my favorites now. But I do have a surprise on. Uh, I have two surprises. This is the sensei. Oh. So this this guy, I'm proud of this guy. This guy's eight inches tall. He's a lot taller than the other. Wow. He has the are they all made from the same material? What material are they the toys yeah, made from? This one's resin, so it's it's this is a couple pounds. It's actually pretty heavy. Wow. It's made with resin. The reason why I like resin is one, you can get all those really cool details, and two is that. Um, is that it, it makes it a little more special. You know, it, it's a little more delicate. It, it, it requires uh, an adult to kind of handle it. So that guy will be available. The comics, I've got caps, this guy right here. So if you want to say a little, give a little gesture to those that try to, you know, put me down, <laughs> that's what you can do. <laughs> so for the toys i wanted to know a little bit more about the creative process if that's okay i don't want you to share any secrets or anything but you know just as a general toy designer when it comes to working with resin like what is the process of that you know sure. as well so um what i do is uh i create um i first do a sketch on the guy uh, on the character uh make sure that i'm good with it uh, try to understand like balance because if they're in a certain pose like this guy, you need a certain uh, center of gravity, right, to kind of hold them in place. Because oh, this guy. Mm -hmm. And once I figure that out, then I do turnaround drawings. Um, I do a little bit of sculpting uh, digitally. I do traditional, but the traditional just bothers me because I can't keep things symmetrical. So mm -hmm. I, do is, um, I hand it off to a a really good 3D sculptor that can sculpt what I want, um, my design. Uh, and then from there, we kind of troubleshoot. You know, I, I, he'll show me something, and then I go, no, no, I want it this way, and tweak this, change that. I kind of orchestrate the whole thing. And then then we 3D print it. Um, mm. Nice. I don't, I don't have a 3D print, though. I do, but I can't show you that one because it's top secret. Uh, no, no problem. <laughs> yeah, so, the three, so then we print it out. When we print it out, we make sure it scans well, the things work. Uh, then you prime it, paint it, and that becomes your prototype. Then, um, because I don't have the time and the patience, I know a lot of people do it by hand. They, um, they make their own molds, silicone molds. Mm -hmm. Pour mm -hmm. resin in, they va vacuum the air out, and there you start to produce your own uh, resin figures. Uh, but what I do, um, I... I take the prototype, ship it out to my friend overseas, and my friend overseas uh, does that casting for me, and he paints it for me because he's a lot better in, in that than I am. And then he uh, sends it back to me, and, and, and then I set it. Right, like so it said, Jers F. Jared, sorry, I'm saying your tag wrong, your Instagram wrong, but he says the outcome is incredible. So how long does that process take if you had to, like, average? I know with COVID, it's probably taking a lot longer, but on average, uh, just to get from point A, you know, start to finish. You know, I can uh, I can work pretty fast. My my team works fast. So I so I have, I'm, I'm, uh, I have my own company. It's uh, Rio's Toy Designs. And uh, Rio's Toy Designs, what we do is we help people make stuff you know um mm -hmm. i do it with the help of my overseas partners but also what i could do is help develop the uh the process here in the states you know so i or and i can design for people i can manage the process i you know that that's kind of what we do um so the, the process can take about um if i drew let's say i drew something up today it's a day it's i'm i'm really fast uh take a day i can uh get it get it in 3d maybe a f about a week and then we can output it in like two days then paint it another two days maybe three days mm -hmm. and then uh send it out when it comes back i'd say like three months it would take for like a concept 
Now that's fast though. You know, a lot of people it has to take about four to six months. But with me, uh, man, it's three months. It's about three months. But with COVID, it really <laughs> like this sensei guy was supposed to be sold a while ago, uh, as well as the blood suckers, um, screw face. So it set me back a little bit. And now what's happening <clears throat> is everything's like coming down like an avalanche. All this work. Mm -hmm. oh my God, but just slow down. But it's a good, it's a good problem to have. Right. Yeah. You know, it's getting some production done, you know, a matter of time that is getting done and, you know, it's releasing this product, you know, to those who you think will find it interesting. You know, it is interesting to know, especially as a toy designer, you know, I wonder what else can you do when it comes to toys? Because I know you probably heard this working at Toys R Us and doing toy design. You know, there's a shift in like, you know, people's like their enjoyment. Like now there's all gaming, you know, that's like comic books are some, you know, whoever are fans or collectors, they'll still collect the comics. Then you got, of course, and I mean, the big ones, of course, are anime and gaming. So how do you fit, you know, just the love of toy design, like to still keep the momentum going with that? That's, that's a, that's a good question. That's a trick. It's a tricky, it's a tricky thing because when you say toy, people think it's young and you can play with it and throw it right. all in. But it's actually, that's why we call them art toys and design toys because what makes art art is the expression, right? That you can express yourself on a canvas, on a wall, uh, on a sticker, on anything. It's yours and that you're, t you're trying to tell a story. So that's why they call it art toys because I don't have to go back to a licensor and say, hey, you know, uh, is, is Superman's S right? Is the curl right? You know, right. it comes from me. So that's why it's an art piece. So we call them art toys, but they're not necessarily toys. They're more like figuras, statues, stuff like that. Right, um, like the figures, yeah. Like the act, like sort of like the Japan does with the Gundams and those kind of action figures, you know. They don't call them action figures. They call them statuettes or something yeah yeah the uh the, the maquettes and the, there's so many other names for them but they are vinyl ones but those vinyl ones are just sometimes as as fragile as the resin stuff so mm -hmm. they, they're they're uh for 15 and up i, I label that on my box even the pins because you know a kid can like poke somebody with those pins. <laughs> right. but um yeah, it's it's meant for it's meant for the older crowd, but I would like eventually to to get into something. There's a few there's a few things that I'm like you know uh, working on where I would like to I'm, I'm pushing things on, on different medias you know to to kind of get the word across because com the comic book thing I've been pretty much selling it myself because there's like a monopoly. Diamond distributors are uh, you know you. Know, Mm, yes <laughs> behemoth and i'm like why 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 do we have to do that why can't somebody just say hey man i want to check out your story pick up a comic but why do we have to have these layers of you know that's a whole nother mm -hmm. thing because yeah it is that, yeah that's why i do my art thing is because i wanted to get rid of that bureaucracy bureaucracy mm -hmm. that right ding, ding. Yeah. yeah we got it yeah no yeah it's true it's definitely like get rid of those higher ups you know i don't even know if you would call them middlemen you know it's just getting rid of that you know chain of command that feels like you know to get to us you got to go through hollywood in a sense you know to be recognized when we could find ways to collaborate you know um which i'll get to my last question but before that while well, i go dean asks what happens if there's a big demand for your toys and how will you increase production I'll just go and tell them we need more. <laughs> Let's hope that happens. Um, I've been selling. I, I've I've been selling. Well, it looks like you have a good trust and connection with the people, the you know, the people that you work with, which is I think important as well. Yeah, I always, always, I go to sleep every night, seriously, and hope that my team just doesn't go. Eh, man, I don't, we don't want to work with you anymore. Then I'm 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 asked out. And I got mm -hmm. to rebuild, but that comes with the territory too. You got to right. strategize. But um, yes, uh, um, how do I, I? How would I fulfill that? I would just. Um, it'll take some time, but you kind of have to gauge your audience. I'm not at the point where um, people are banging down the door and just like I gotta have one of those real. 
Um, hopefully we get to that point. But right now I, I have a nice, it's ramping up slowly. It's nice. It's uh, people get to, you know, I send a personal message with everything checked out and I have a good connection with the audience and with the consumers. So I appreciate them. They appreciate me. I'm, I'm happy to help them out. Um, the more orders would be great. I, I just don't ever want to lose that um, connection. I think that's important too, which goes to my last question before we wrap things up here is you've answered the question before when I sent you about a short Q&A I do called Get to Know Me where I have entrepreneurs, creative come on and just do a short Q&A. So the same question, um, how do you envision collaboration for your art and as your business? Uh, collaborations, as you know, come in many forms, right? Uh, I see collaborations as a mutual beneficial partnership, not, hey man, which I get a lot, hey man, uh, make me some, sh make me some figures. And I'm like, come on, bro, there's a little etiquette, you know, to social media too that you should carry. And I just want, yeah. you know, but some people are like, uh, they can be rude and I just ignore it and just keep moving. Um, but when you feel like, there's a collaboration and it's more you just like spilling your guts out and these people just wanting to kind of, you know, take advantage of your information or your, your, your process, you know, because I, I, I bust my hump for many, many years as a toy designer, graphic designer, father, you know, I, I've been in the streets and it's, uh, I bust my behind to get where I am. Uh, I'm not really exactly where I want to be, but but I'm happy though, you know, it's not like, uh, I, I am actually fine with where I am. I just feel like, and I'm probably going, I'm rearing off topic here, but I created a monster almost. Like at first you create something and it's yours. Like you create it, you, you, now you can control it. And mm -hmm. you it's something that's kind of snowballed and now it creates me. Like now, like the fulfillment that we were talking about, now I got to order more for what? For that product. Why do I have, now I got to do these things and change my life around. So that it's like the, the dog dragging the, the owner, you know, and that's mm -hmm. what's been happening to me lately. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm, I have to get up in the morning and do extra work for these characters. It's almost like they're living, but anyway, getting back to mm -hmm. the collaborative thing, it is uh, it has to be a beneficial thing. That's how I see it. Uh, it also has to, it has to bring some positivity um, to what you're doing, what they're doing. And overall, as a culture, I, I believe at least that's what, you know, I, I uh, that's how I do my thing. Right. Yeah, I definitely think that's true. It's just knowing that you're doing something, you're passionate about it. It's like they say, you, if you love what you're doing, you won't feel like you work a day in your life. Right. And that's my kind case. of, a I mean, thank God, um, um, you know, and I want to give a shout out to everybody that's like tuning in. I see a lot of messages coming in and I can't really answer them. I'm talk we're talking here, but uh, I appreciate you guys tuning in, and I appreciate you all. Because I've seen there's a few like uh, people that, that follow me on Instagram, and I follow them, and I got mad love for you guys. Okay, so I just wanted to like acknowledge. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you, everyone who's tuning in, and we'll tune in later. Very much appreciated. Absolutely, but uh, yeah, I just um, collaborations. You know, that's a word that's really thrown out very loosely nowadays. And mm -hmm. really, you don't get to see any benefit. Like when I do a collaboration with somebody, at least an artist, I like to to give a little extra, you know, to make it special. You know, if it's a collaboration, it's it should be something that people are excited about um, and and really uh, gravitate towards. So I can give. So I go, okay, let me draw some something special for that moment. Let me do things in a different color and just make them know that not only the person that's collaborating with me, but that the consumer is happy and, and loves to, to see that collaboration happen, which I have a few down the road. Um, and I saw this image yesterday uh, from how this, everything's coming out. <clears throat> and it looks amazing. And you guys got to keep tuning in because this is going to be a game changer. It's, it's coming soon. Yes, yeah, we, that's always, it's a pleasure. I'm humbled to get to speak with you. And where can people find you? Because I also add those in the description as well. You can find me at uh, Rios underscore toy underscore designs underscore. Or you can find me on Facebook, Rios Toy Designs. 
Um, pick up the comic, check check out what I got on foodstamps.com. Again, that's F-U-S-T-A-M-P-S.com. And uh, yeah, just just follow me because it's a, it's going to be a wild roller coaster. So I appreciate you guys that uh, follow me now and checking out the comics and so forth. And uh, well, I'll just keep doing my thing as long as you guys keep receiving me the way you do. And thank you. Thank you for having me here. I truly appreciate it. I got so much love for you and respect. And uh, if you guys are not following her, you better because she's got <laughs> some nice fire stuff. Yes, thank you all so much. I'm truly blessed. And if you tune in now, you can tune in also on Instagram TV. Leave your comment there as well. This has been the 10th episode. We've made it. And Rios was my last guest for the summer season series. So I thank you so much for joining me. And stay tuned. I'll have the next season coming soon.